This episode of Metatrex is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. There's no greater challenge than the study of philosophy. My philosophy is that there is room for all philosophies on this station. Welcome, everyone, to Episode 74 of Metatrax, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. My name is Mike Morrison, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, Zachary Fruling. Today, we'll be discussing the use of narratives and meta-narratives in Star Trek. Zachary, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I'm a little tired. I was kind of hoping I could just sit down and you could tell me a nice story since we're talking about narratives. Yeah, I did notice, Zachary, that you look a little kicked back and relaxed, ready to hear a good story. We're going to talk today about narratives and meta-narratives, and there are lots of great examples in Star Trek of storytelling and narratives, meta-narratives. We talked in episode 72 when we discussed our essential philosophy list for the second season of Enterprise. We talked about the episode Carbon Creek, and we talked a little bit about the philosophy of storytelling and narrative. And it got me thinking that uh, this is a topic that we haven't really tackled, and I thought it would be an interesting conversation to take a look at some of these episodes and look at Star Trek as a whole, look at the narratives and meta narratives that make up Star Trek, and take a look particularly at some episodes within Star Trek where where we see examples of of storytelling because in the grand scheme of things Star Trek is a story being told but within Star Trek are some really great episodes where narrative and meta narrative is really part of the story and I f- I think that's really fascinating I'm looking forward to talking about that I think it's interesting that you and I come at this from such very different positions. As an author and and writer, a fiction storyteller, you come at this naturally from the storytelling standpoint. And I come at this more from the philosophical standpoint. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm interested more in the long-term story arcs, the overarching themes and stories and messages that Star Trek conveys as a whole. In other words, what I would call the meta-narratives that tie the individual stories that make up an episode or a particular movie in Star Trek into what we collectively know as the Star Trek ethos or the Star Trek worldview. So what are the meta narratives? And here in the real world, we have meta narratives. You know, we have um, stories about democracy and stories about enlightenment and stories about who we are as a people that bind us all together and unify the seemingly disparate uh, events that make up day-to-day life. And I think it's hard to envision what life without a meta narrative would be like. And yet in these postmodern times, as you might call them, you could argue that we've lost faith in some of our own meta narratives. You know, I think the narratives of progress and enlightenment don't ring as true as they did 40 or 50 years ago. Even, even during the run of the original series, we were firmly in the middle of a progressive 1960s time. And whether those, those progressive meta narratives still ring true with us today is a very interesting question. So I, I'm coming at this more from the meta narrative standpoint. And I think you're coming at this a little more from the storytelling standpoint. Sure, sure. And I think there's an important distinction that we need to make right off the bat, Zachary. When we talk about meta narrative, the 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 tying together the overall arc, arcing story within Star Trek, I think it's important to make a distinction that we're not talking about canon. We're not talking about the continuity of Star Trek, although that's a part of that meta narrative. 
it's not the meta narrative in and of itself. So I think it's an important distinction to make. I know as we talk about meta narratives and, and this overarching theme, it's really easy for the mind to go straight to canon and continuity. And I just want to say right off the bat, just make the distinction that while that's a part of the meta narrative, it's not the meta narrative itself. Well, I think the notion of Star Trek canon is like a really weak sense of meta narrative. Yes, canon unifies all the different stories together into a coherent whole, but that doesn't address the question of meaning. Like, what does it all mean, right? In the Star Trek universe, Star Trek is committed to certain stories about human nature and the pro and the progress of our species into the future. So, by meta narratives in Star Trek, I mean things more like these kinds of messages: through technological progress, we will solve problems of scarcity, and that mm -hmm. will lead to a better human condition through coming together politically we will be able to solve the problems of war and that will lead to a more uh you know peaceful galactic society things like human beings no longer working for money and that allows us to focus on the activities that really have add meaning and lead to you know genuine fulfillment in life these are these are broad themes in star trek and it, and you can look at the individual episodes in light of these broad themes and these broad themes serve to unify all those stories together into a message like who we are and where we're going and what our purpose is and that i think is a deeper sense of meta narrative than something like canon, which yes, unifies, um, you know, the Star Trek universe together from a storytelling standpoint, but doesn't directly address the question of meaning and what it all means for us and who we are and where we're going. And you're absolutely right that I, I tend to look at the storytelling aspect of it. And that's just that's just going to be my nature. I am I'm a storyteller and a fiction writer. And so I'm I'm kind of down in the weeds, really looking at the individual stories and appreciating how they make up the whole. One of the things that we talked about when we were discussing Carbon Creek was the fact that the story of Carbon Creek has the potential to rewrite a history within the Star Trek universe. And I find that incredibly fascinating. And Star Trek is really, that meta narrative that we're talking about is really made up of individual stories. And those individual stories are woven together to create an incredible tapestry. Did you see how I did that? <laughs> Well, I, th I think there's two ways of looking at this. One way is that you can use storytelling from an episodic standpoint as a way of bringing a meta narrative to life, right? And I think you can look at individual episodes in the Star Trek universe as doing that, taking this overall theme, compressing it down into an ins individual incident and writing a story about that that illuminates mm -hmm. this overall theme. And you can look at the meta narrative as the theme that binds all of these individual stories together. And I think you could really get at this notion of narratives versus meta narratives in either direction. You can use individual stories as a way of uh, compressing a meta narrative down into an incident that is uh, dramatic from a storytelling standpoint. Or you can use the the progression of stories and individual tales and weave them together into some broader narrative. And I think in, in the real world, we do this all the time. Like, you know, take an incident from American history, something like the Boston Tea Party. That That's a great, you know, an individual narrative in the, in the overall meta narrative of American history, right? It's an interesting story. You could tell a great little um, isolated episodic story about the Boston Tea Party, right? But if you ask, what does the Boston Tea Party mean? If you step back and go, what does it mean to be an American? What are the, what are the movements? What are the moods? What are the progressions that define us as a people here in the United States? That will be one of the incidents. But you, you, you almost have to look at that incident in light of the overall narrative the meta narrative, the grand narrative of being an American from oppression to revolution on into the progression of liberty and civil rights. And you can tell this broad brushstroke story about American history and look at an incident like the Boston Tea Party in light of that overall narrative. And you could argue that the, the broader narrative, the meta narrative adds meaning to that individual story that's not contained in the story itself. It certainly does. And sometimes, Zachary, we look over nuances of a story that perhaps lend itself to 
that broader narrative. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, for instance, in that episode, Carbon Creek, how this was an untold story. And and by the way, I'm I'm really fascinated by the idea, and I hope we have uh, time and the ability to talk about it in this episode of Metatrex. I, I, I find it interesting in the Star Trek universe, the way we tell stories within the story if you if you follow my meaning i hope we hope we get a chance to talk a little bit about that because there are lots of great examples of stories being told within the star trek universe that uh i I think generally lend itself to and and help build that meta narrative but sometimes it's these stories that don't get told it's for, for instance, you and I both are, are lovers of genealogy, and there are these incredible untold stories of people who, you know, they're, they're not George Washington, but they were in that boat crossing the Delaware. And they're as much a part of the meta narrative as, uh, as say, a George Washington. Uh, but we, you know, we don't hear their stories. They're not as common. We, we tend to pass things down. We have an oral tradition. Uh, even, even in uh, school, we had our history books, but it was, you know, it was the lecturing, it's the telling of the story. And we've done that for, for eons as, as human beings. We are storytellers by nature. And some philosophers, uh, C.S. Lewis is, is one that uh, comes to mind, a great uh, philosopher, a storyteller in his own right. Uh, he surmised once that we've we've been telling the same story this story of of redemption f- for for eons since the dawn of time we've been telling this story of oppression and redemption and i i, I find that very fascinating and certainly within star trek we see those types of stories i think about tom paris i think about you know wesley crusher i think about these these great stories that we we tend to to gravitate towards and we root for the underdog that's part of that net meta narrative zachary that i think is is really buried deep within our own psyche you make an interesting point that in a way the same old stories the same narratives or the same meta narratives tend to resurge you know they 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 come back you can find them in individual tales right the the tom paris redemption story is a great example of a classic mm-hmm. theme that's brought to life in a new instance every time you retell the story with new characters and new situations on the other hand i think here in our day and age what I would call postmodern times, you know, modernism in the sense of progression. We saw the progression of the Enlightenment and the progression of technology into the 20th century, the progression of civil rights and liberties. We've lived the grand narratives of history over the last several hundred years, right? But now we've seen the collapse of some of those narratives, right? We saw the narrative of imperialism in the British Empire in the 20th century collapse into the collapse of the British Empire, right? We've seen empires collapse. We've seen the Enlightenment for the last four or five hundred years, but we've seen the end results of that with, say, science producing things like the atomic bomb, right? So, you know, these grand narratives have had kind of a dark underbelly that we've also seen. And I think the the cultural results of that has been that we don't have as much blind faith in the meta narratives themselves that have historically bound us together and defined who we are and where we're going and what our trajectory is. Because we've seen the negative results and we've seen the dark underbellies, we've seen the empires collapse. You know, you can go right on down the list, these kind of classic meta narratives of Western society, imperialism, enlightenment reason, liberty, democracy, civil rights, world history, mm-hmm. even even on the other side of the ocean, Marxism and communism. Right. Um, religious people have their meta narratives, whether they're meta narratives of creation or redemption or end times. Mm-hmm. Um, even science has its meta narratives of evolution, how we fit into the overall evolution of uh, you know life on our planet or of the cosmos. Right? They, these are grand narratives that unify us all together. Mm-hmm. But each one of these has kind of a dark underbelly that, if you draw attention to it, you go, "Wait a minute! There, you know, these aren't as." 
they're they're great concepts you know I, historically they've bound us together but we've seen that they also lead to consequences that maybe we don't like <laughs> in some cases sure so i think the position of for a lot of us these days whether we know it or not i think a lot of times we we're not reflecting on it and we just kind of take these things for granted but i think the end result has been that our position is one of skepticism every time we hear a new grand narrative about who we are and where we're going and what our purpose is we kind of go well yeah but is that really kind of realistic i don't know if I really buy that. And I think that this this starting point of skepticism is interesting because here we are having lived all of these grand narratives and seen their collapse or at least their cracks and their dark dark underbellies. Here we are, you know, the second decade of the 21st century, looking forward into the future. Let's look at the Star Trek universe and talk about the grand narratives of the Star Trek universe. Mm -hmm. Will technology ever get us to the point where we build starships and go have, you know, grand adventures like Captain Kirk or Captain Picard on the Enterprise? Will technology get to a point where we solve problems and can play classical music on the Enterprise (laughs) in our leisure time because we've solved all the other problems? Will we ever solve our interpersonal problems to the point where we can focus on being the best versions of our ourselves and have genuine teamwork and genuine collaboration without all of those petty squabbles that define human interpersonal relationships. Will those things ever be realistic? <laughs> and and I think if not, then you run the risk of saying, well, what does that say about the grand narrative of Star Trek then? Is, you know, can we just write off the entire grand narrative of the Star Trek universe as unrealistic? And I think that that's a really genuine concern here in this second decade of the 21st century insofar as we've seen the collapse of these stories and these these narratives, every time someone comes along and says, I've got a new narrative that tells you who you are and what you need to do and all the problems it's going to solve. We look at those people and we go, you're a snake oil salesperson, (laughs) right? So, you know, I think it's interesting to look at, at, at the universe that Gene Roddenberry created and the trajectory he saw us going on. And Gene Roddenberry, of course, came up with the Star Trek universe smack in the middle of the 20th century, smack Mm -hmm. in the middle of enlightenment, smack in the middle of progress. We hadn't seen the collapse of all the narratives yet, right? And, you know, can we look at Gene Roddenberry and say, you know, you're really kind of peddling snake oil. The human nature is not amenable to that kind of smooth, progressive, idealistic meta narratives that we all find appealing as Star Trek fans. But I think it's important to ask, is this really a realistic vision of human nature and who we are and where we're going and what our purpose is? And if not, what does that say about the idealism of Star Trek from from the perspective of meta narratives or grand narratives? Zachary, I think one thing that history in our own world has taught us is that stories can very much shape the grand narrative and you ask the question, you know, can the can the meta narrative of Star Trek can that ethos really uh, is it is it something that's achievable or is it or is it snake oil? And I I think the I think the simple answer to that is like many stories, it gives us something to aspire to. And I, I think about some of the great stories that have been taught. I mean, and again, my background is theology, and I, I'm going to just kind of lean back on that a little bit. Even from the perspective of someone who isn't necessarily religious, I've had some wonderful conversations with people over over the years who uh, who were atheists. And I, I one of those conversations stands out in my mind in, in which this gentleman told me, you know, there is there was no doubt in his mind that the Bible truly was the greatest story ever told. And he really had a lot to say about the ways in which the Bible has shaped progress over uh, over the centuries and how people who have ascribed to the teachings of Christ have really a- achieved a higher quality of humanity than you know perhaps they would have uh, had they not uh, ascribed to those teachings and he had a, a a real respect, although he wasn't a believer, he had a real respect for the narrative of the Bible and the fact that this is a story that has helped shape and 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 alter and and drive the progress of humanity. And I think in much the same way, I think that Star Trek has a similar potential because it does uh, it does project humanity. 
uh, going forward and and progressing technologically and unifying together and and building a society in which the you know there is no lack and unifying under this banner of of exploration and bettering ourselves and and I don't think those are bad things I don't think anyone who's listening to this podcast are going to say those are bad things uh, I think we can all agree those are good things and those are things that we can aspire to now uh, certainly I, I think it's debatable whether or not we'll be in you know warp capable ships by the 23rd century I I don't know the answer to that but I do know that Star Trek has already given us something to shoot for well yeah i i guess in terms of skepticism about meta narratives i didn't really mean whether or not technological future will come into into existence because technology is going to progress we'll invent new things we will probably invent something like starships eventually right whether that will be in line with the overall meta narrative of star trek is a really interesting question but you made an interesting point that the language of meta narratives can provide motivation for action like here in the united states mm-hmm. you know having grown up with language of oppression and revolution and liberty you know that gives people reason to act in certain scenarios and people have fought and died in wars for these concepts right these aren't these aren't hollow concepts you know they've led people to genuine action to solve real real problems and take action in the world around them and i think similarly you know looking at the star trek universe that can provide something like an idealistic vision to shoot for along the lines of plato's republic right here's an idealistic vision of of what you know, the, the world or society could be. Mm-hmm. And one of the obvious critiques, even, even 2,500 years ago in Plato's Republic was, is this really realistic? <laughs> and, you know, Plato gave an interesting answer, which was, well, it provides a, a, a vision, a goal to shoot for, whether it's realistic or not, it provides a target to aim towards, mm-hmm. right? That can, prov- that provides some motivation for action. But I think you have this fundamental problem when people look at the at the overall story and go, yeah, I just don't believe it anymore. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that's that's the deep kind of insidious problem about meta narratives. We've seen the collapse of so many of these grand stories that it's it's like we've ceased believing in the story. I think you're right. When people have really drunk the Kool-Aid and they believe in the meta narrative, then they're willing to fight and die and make changes in the world and do things, right? If there's an apathy and if people don't really believe the meta narratives anymore, then we lose our motivation to actually act. And I'm kind of reminded of a phrase from Nietzsche. You mentioned religion. I think, you know, if there's any, if there are any category of meta narratives that are alive and well, I would say religious meta narratives are alive and well. Mm-hmm. You know, right wing religious people have their their meta narratives about redemption and salvation and end times and you know all of the all of the uh, sort of you know right wing you know, Christian worldview. And you and I are part of that in some ways, but I, I tend to step back and see the meta narrative of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, in other parts of the world, they've got their Islamic jihadist meta narratives, right? Everyone's got their meta narratives about sure. what direction world history is going in. So I think religious meta narratives are actually kind of alive and well. But thinking about that, I'm reminded of of Nietzsche's famous phrase that God is dead and, and we have killed We've him, right? Killed him, yeah. But, you know, what that really means, I think, is that we just don't believe it anymore. Yeah, you can you can tell all the religious meta narratives you want, but someone who's already had a crisis of faith or doesn't believe anymore, they're going to go, yeah, I just don't believe any of that nonsense you just told me. <laughs> and that's not going to inspire them for action. So if that's our position in response to meta narratives, that whenever someone says, I've got this narrative about about who we are and where we're going, like I'm thinking of like someone like Karl Marx. Here's the the meta narrative, you know, you proletariat have been oppressed and there's going to be an uprising of the proletariat. There's going to be a genuinely egalitarian society that's not based on capitalism. It's going to be based on the uh, you'll get to be a co-owner of the fruits of your own labor. It's very kind of idealistic. You know, you look at that and go, well, I just don't believe that. <laughs> that hasn't happened here in the United States. The meta narratives Yes, they've produced in real action, but they haven't produced a kind of utopian egalitarian society. There's still lots of problems with it, with inequalities and and uh, civil rights and whatnot. So you know the the at the end of the day, 
the meta narratives have not come to fruition in the way that they promised they would. And I think if you step back and you look at that and go, well, you know, for all the talk of that religious people have about about human nature and the best possible version of ourselves, a lot of them are really kind of jerks. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, if you look at the United States, you know, yes, we have all this talk about liberty and equality, but then look at all the oppression, look at all the inequalities, look at all the discrimination. What a lot of mumbo jumbo that is that the United States has to peddle. If you look at the at, at the Star Trek universe, look at look at what technology can do for us. It can solve our medical problems. It can solve our problems with scarcity. You go, yeah, but I'm still slaving away at a minimum wage job. So I just don't buy it. The technology yeah. is making life better in the way that Star Trek says it's going to. So having seen all of that, if you take the time to think about whether these meta narratives really deliver on their promises, I think it's really plausible to say, well, they kind of don't. They might provide some motivation for people to get out of bed and do stuff, but they never quite deliver in the way that they claim to. You know, you mentioned earlier the Revolutionary War, and it occurs to me that even our own American Revolution was driven by narrative. I I think about Thomas Paine, and I think about Paul Revere, I think about Uh, really the leaflets and pamphlets and things that were produced and printed. And it was this, this perfect storm because you had, you had these, these orators who were literally taking to the streets. You had men like Payne who were writing pamphlets and leaflets and distributing them. And even then we were a very literate society. Then people were the, the American colonists were avid readers. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And then, you know, you add to that the fact that there were these uh, these patriot pastors, we call them the, the, the uh, black-robed regiment, and how they were able to really shake things up in the church as well, because their, their sermons were, were driven toward this idea of liberty and freedom, and it just kind of added to that overall narrative to the point that, you know, the, these peasants over here in the colonies were ready to rise up against the monarchy. And, you know, that was the, that was really the American revolution. (laughs) I don't think it's an accident, Zachary, to say that there's a prime example of how narrative really can change history. Well, it almost sounds like you're saying history. It almost sounds like you're saying that the Star Trek universe needs its orator or it needs its <laughs> pamphlet writer, right? Someone who can really take these concepts of the Star Trek universe, convey them in a narrative fashion that really does appeal to people at some visceral level that they can internalize that will make it part of their identity. And I think for hardcore Star Trek fans, that's totally true, right? We see the possibility of mankind into the future, and that is part of our meta narrative. Like, that's the trajectory that we're aiming towards. Whether mm. it's realistic or not, we've internalized. It. I don't think that's true for some people, but I also don't think that I've seen the ideals of the Star Trek universe conveyed in such a an oratory kind of fashion that is so viscerally convincing that you can't <laughs> help but assent to it. And I would love to, I don't know what that means. Maybe we're doing it right here, right? I don't know. I love that the idea that that's true, that this kind of discussion spawns people to go, yes, I'm going to take up the baton or I'm going to pick up my pick up my phaser and I'm going to go, you know, blaze forward into the into the future and I'm going I'm going to build it no matter what. I'm going to fight my little Star Trek revolution here. Um, but in reality, I think a lot of people just aren't motivated in that way. And and I, I mean, and, and I also have this deeper question, like what distinguishes genuinely, um, how to put it? I also have this deeper question of what distinguishes meta narratives that are virtuous, that should be. Um, embraced versus meta narratives that are kind of destructive or meta narratives that are more like snake oil. I'm thinking of things like Scientology, right? That's a that's got a meta narrative <laughs> about who we are and what we should do, and I don't believe it. I think um, you know it has its dark sides, and I just sort of go, yep, that's snake oil. So what distinguishes like a genuine meta narrative that we should all embrace versus something that is more like snake oil? And I don't have the answer to that question because they, had, on the surface, they have the same structure. Mm-hmm. They're, you you internalize them. They motivate you at some sort of visceral level. They spawn you to action. But what distinguishes the healthy ones from the unhealthy ones are the ones we should strive for versus the ones we shouldn't strive for. And given that we live uh, amongst many of these competing meta narratives, how do you sort of sort the proverbial wheat from the chaff? Right? How do you how do you distinguish like this is a good meta narrative worth striving towards because it has high ideals and because it's 
possibly realistic and could make us better people versus someone's really, you know, peddling this narrative to make a buck or peddling this narrative, you know, to be manipulative or for their own, you know, uh, personal uh, satisfaction or their own personal rewards, right? So how do you distinguish the two? Because I think there's a qualitative difference. And I think the Star Trek you know, version of a meta narrative is a little more along the lines of real. I mean, certainly people peddle Star Trek too, right? They're selling movies and selling DVDs and selling whatever, right? So it's not that people aren't peddling Star Trek, but I think Star Trek appeals in some way to our to our highest ideals. Just like religious meta narratives at their best, I think appeal to our highest ideals when they're at their best. Although there's some very self destructive religious narratives, and there's probably some self destructive Star Trek narratives too. But um, I think there's a difference there, and I think I don't think it's easy to spell out what. They are because if you look at how they motivate people, they, they motivate people in the exact same way, right? Our, our highest ideals, we do internalize and we do go, yes, that's who we are. That's the best version of ourselves. So let's get out of bed and make it happen. But you can, you can run that narrative about Islamic jihadism, or you can run that narrative about Scientology. So mm-hmm. what distinguishes these great narratives from the, uh, the other narratives that um, uh, are just as appealing viscerally when people internalize them? Yeah, and that's a really fascinating question that you that you raise, and it's not an easy question to answer. I think about, for instance, some of these some of these competing ideas. Think about uh, capitalism versus communism or Marxism. Uh, you, I mean, I I have I have friends personally. I have friends who really subscribe to the ideals of Marxism. Well, uh, our, you could say Star Trek embraces a great many of the ideals of Marxism. Sure, sure. And, you know, on the other side of that, you have, you know, capitalists who, you know, are just foaming at the mouth, rabid, uh, in, in opposition to those ideals. And and it's there's tension on both sides. You, you could certainly could not put a group of Marxists and a group of capitalists in the same room. Well together without but I, some I guess, type of war breaking But I guess out, that's but. my point, that e- each side of any e- any competing meta narratives, right, whichever yes. side you fall on, each side finds its meta narrative the most convincing. So Certainly. how do you adjudicate between all of these competing narratives, given that everyone who believes, genuinely believes in a meta narrative isn't just going with the flow? Because I think there's a way of just going with the flow. Like, I, I mean, there are some Americans that do that, right? We're, this is the country we're in. You know, we don't maybe believe the grand narrative anymore, but we're going with the flow because this is the country we're in. There's a trajectory that you're just along for the ride for. So not those people, the people that really genuinely believe in the narratives that define who they are and where they're going and the people that they're a part of, right? Um, yeah, Zachary, I'm reminded of that scene from uh, Austin Powers when he wakes up out of cryo freeze <laughs> and he believes that uh, the communist one, he goes over to the to the Russian and he says, we really stuck it to those capitalist pigs, didn't we, comrade? And, Wait, wasn't that an episode from the first season of TNG when all the 21st, 20th century people were uh, cryogenically frozen but woken up? I think I saw that episode of Star Trek. <laughs> But it's funny because, oh, that, I mean, that's a great example. Look at the, I mean, it's. But Austin, the, we won. Yay, capitalism. <laughs> so that episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, the end of season one called The Neutral Zone, mm-hmm. is really interesting because all these 20th century people are woken up and they've all got their meta narratives. There's the dude who's like a capitalist and there's the the musician who's, you know, a country singer and he's got his. Sonny. Sunny, right? I can't remember the characters' names, but the, the tw- it's funny how sort of cute and ridiculous the 20th century meta narratives look from the perspective of the 24th century, right? Those meta narratives that define us as a 21st, well, now 21st century people, but then 20th century people. I the, the, that's a brilliant episode because it's trying to say, look at how ridiculous these 20th century meta narratives are from the perspective of the future. But I guess my concern is that will we look at the meta narrative that we see in the Star Trek universe in 200 years or 400 years or a thousand years and go, well, that was a cute idea, but we just don't believe it anymore. <laughs> I mean, the future has a way of kind of erasing the the forcefulness of past narratives. And I'm interested in those meta narratives and those ideals that are kind of timeless, that will continue to be ideals and continue to be a trajectory that we aim towards you know, indefinitely into the future because they really are qualitatively better ideals. But, you know, like the, like the 20th century capitalist in that episode, right? He um, has ideals that are not as idealistic as the ideals we see in the Star Trek universe plausibly. And that's why it looks, you know, a little ridiculous. And I love how just ridiculously those characters were portrayed totally stereotypically to drive home the force of the ridiculousness of their worldview. Mm-hmm. 
I guess my concern is that you can take any meta narrative you want, and if you take the position of skepticism and look at it in hindsight, you might go, well, that was a cute idea for a while, but we just don't believe it anymore. And will there be some ideals, and, and in particular, does Star Trek have some of those ideals that will stand the test of time and be truly timeless ideals versus something we look at in four or 500 years and kind of laugh at in retrospect? And I think there, you know, I'm not a total skeptic about ideals. I think some ideals genuinely are timeless. But when you tell them in terms of of meta narratives, these grand stories about the progress of mankind, I think you can plausibly go, well, history hasn't really worked out that way so far. So what reason do I have to think that it's going to get any better? And I, I just don't see that uh, even a very convincing idealistic story can genuinely address this this position of skepticism. And when people have been burned by meta narratives of the past, whether recently or in the in in the uh, distant past, what reason do we have for thinking that meta narratives carry that that idealistic force that that is not something like snake oil, just a, an empty promise that will never come to fruition that might motivate us, but and we might even you know idealize, but will it ever come to fruition in any, in any meaningful sense? And I and I think and I'm kind of painting this out to be an all or nothing picture because I think in reality change happens and progress happens and we solve some problems and we introduce some other problems. So in reality it's just more complex than that. But the complexity I think highlights the fact that the meta narratives themselves aren't doing all the work. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. If you look at the story of, of the United States, yes, we have ideals of freedom and liberty and and uh, and emancipation and these things that define our, our own American history. But, you know, we've solved some problems. We've created some other problems. There's this ongoing work that that is, is necessary. And I think those ideals can um, spawn us to take up the baton and keep working at the problems and try to make the world a little bit better. But I think it's unrealistic to say we'll solve all the problems in one fell swoop because of the meta narrative. So I'm not sure that it's the meta narrative that's really doing all the work there. I mean, history is just going to march on. We'll continue to solve some problems. New problems will emerge and on and on we go through the across the, the decades and centuries. But whether you can look back in retrospect and and unify all of history into a narrative is, is um, an interesting question because I think you, you can certainly try. You can look at all of Western history from the ancient Greek civilization to the Western Enlightenment to the to the dawn of the United States to the progression of liberty and civil rights in the United States culminating in today. And today is the pinnacle of history, right? Hmm. You can tell that story about the United States and world history. But I guess my question is, does anyone actually believe that story? We were all told that story growing up in junior high and high school history classes and in our college history classes. And hopefully they're telling a slightly more sophisticated version of it nowadays. But that's essentially the story of Western civilization that we were told. So in 300 years, in the 24th century, will we be able to look at all of our actual world history, our history today, future history, culminating in the 24th century and go, there was a grand progression culminating in the 24th century. And I think we, that's the, 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 the position that the Star Trek universe takes, that all of history culminates in this more idealistic society that we call the Federation or Starfleet or whatever, right, in the Star Trek universe. And I guess, do we really believe that all of history is on this is on this inevitable trajectory toward progress culminating in something more idealistic. Now, every generation tends to look back and go, we're the culmination of world history. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Undoubtedly, in the, four, in the 24th century, they will actually have a story like that. We don't know what it will be because we have it hasn't unfolded yet. We've got 300 more years of history to go. But um, I guess, you know, I think even in our own history, we can go, well... You know, these great grand narratives, these meta narratives about world history, especially here in the Western world, they're true on the one hand. You can go, there was a progression from the ancient Greek world into, you know, a, kind of a, a fall of the of civilization in the Dark Ages, culminating in the Enlightenment, culminating in democracy and freedom and liberty and these high ideals, culminating in us today with this technological society and all of these ideals. Um, but we kind of go, well... It's just been more complicated than that. There are people who were left out of that picture. There were people that were oppressed along the way. There were people that were hurt and and people that we mm-hmm. people that you know that were killed you know in the name of those things. Mm-hmm. This is not a simple story like that. So I think right. we can recognize the fact that we can recognize it. I think shows that maybe we don't believe the narrative anymore. Because I think fifty years ago, I think people more naively believed the narrative that. 
I mean, the way they taught civics classes and history classes 50 years ago, I think, I think, I think shows this, right? This is the world we grew up in, in a way that, you know, these kind of naive stories about, about the progress of, of Western civilization. But the fact that we look back and go, well, it was a little more complicated than that. And well, a lot of people were hurt along the way. And well, maybe the end result hasn't been as great as, as, as was advertised 50 years ago. Does that question the entire narrative. And, and I think, you know, we as a society today, whether it's we're talking about the United States narrowly or Western civilization more broadly or humanity, you know, from the perspective of the Star Trek universe, does do the the dark spots and the underbellies and the, and the, the, the cracks in the narrative, do they threaten the entire narrative or is the narrative strong enough and convincing enough and, and have high enough ideals to persist even despite all of those those cracks and dark underbellies? And you said quite a bit there and there, there's a couple of things that I want to say in response. You know, you, you're asking the question, do people still believe the narrative? And I, I have to say that, yes, I, I still believe the narrative. I can say with, with beyond Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I still believe the narrative, but I also acknowledge that that narrative that we were given, for instance, in my sixth grade American history class, that narrative is incomplete because it was it was missing some of those individual stories that I was talking about earlier. I, I don't disbelieve the narrative because I don't have the whole picture because, for instance, I wasn't told about the suffering or I wasn't told, uh, you know, this little nuance of the story that actually has a big impact. Uh, but the history that we were given, the history we read about in the history books, I, I still believe that, but I, I I also understand that there's more to it than that. So I think that when we get to the future, I think there'll be more to it than that. And that's what I appreciate about storytelling within the Star Trek universe. We have the, the grand narrative. We know that in the Star Trek universe, humanity made contact with, with an alien species, but we didn't know the, that the, who that species was until we got the movie First Contact. It tells that story. But And I'm glad we got there because we were talking about this in the turbo lift, and I'm, I'm glad we've gotten here because we have this great little snapshot in this movie um, – uh, about how that all fits together. The grand narrative was this, you know, this heroic Zephram Cochran who rose literally from the ashes of World War Three, and he took a missile and and this this, this is symbol great, of this destruction. This is a great meta narrative. The, this, here's the meta narrative, you know, this symbol of destruction, and he made it a symbol of peace and 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 a symbol of the future and. And but we get to see who that great hero Zephram Cocker really was, and we find out within the story, First Contact, that you know he he wasn't exactly the way history portrayed him, and and isn't that real life? And I I, I find that very fascinating. And and again, it's these it's these little stories that we don't always uh, we we don't always hear, we don't always tell. I think that are just as much a a part of that meta narrative. Now, one other thing that you said before we go on that uh, you were talking about, you know, who is there a great orator? And I have to, I have to respond to that and say that I heard, and I'm going to butcher this and I'm going to apologize in advance for butchering this. I had the privilege of, of getting to sit in on a TNG uh, reunion panel one time. And it was uh, it was the entire TNG uh, cast minus Patrick Stewart. Gates was supposed to be there, but she had to cancel last minute. And it was all moderated by uh, William Shatner. And it was the best hour and a half I think I've I, I've ever had at a live event. I just I laughed. I, I I laughed myself to to the point of of nearly crying. And you know just watching this cast interact with one another and tell stories. I had the privilege of hearing Jonathan Frakes recount a, a conversation that he had with uh, with a great bird of the galaxy himself, Gene Roddenberry. Gene pulled him aside and said to him, "In the future, he believed that there would be uh, there would be no hunger, there would be no war, that it would be you know progressively far better than what it is now." And Jonathan said, and when he said that. I believed it. And to answer your question, I think I think Star Trek is the product of that great orator. 
uh, who believed in a future where there would be no starvation, where there would be no war, where we would work to better ourselves, where we would unify and where we would explore the galaxy and we would uh, we would continue to progress and become part of not not just a global community but a, an intergalactic community and you know i i have to say as i as i've watched star trek over the years like jonathan frakes i i believe that it's possible just like in the star trek universe that there are many things that got us to there and i realize that history won't necessarily unfold like that but when i open up my news feed and i read that we have successfully transported a molecule from one place to another and you know when i tap something out on my ipad and and so forth and so on i have to just smile and say you know i think Star Trek played a hand in all of this. I I think about uh, all of the people who said that they were inspired to take up the sciences because of Star Trek. I, you know, I think about astronauts who became astronauts because of Star Trek because of that narrative. And you know, who knows, maybe two or three generations down the road someone's inspired to take up the sciences or become an astronaut because of that scientist or because of that astronaut, because of that philosopher, Zachary. Maybe maybe somebody's inspired by your philosophy. Don't even take into consideration what inspired you, and they're, yet they're being influenced by Star Trek and don't even know it. See, I think you should actually give up on storytelling and go into meta narrative writing because you're you're pretty convincing at telling the uh, telling the the story of Star Trek. But I, I think you know it's important again to take the critical standpoint, not to be a pessimist because I'm probably one of the more optimistic, <laughs> idealistic people out there. But to take the critical position and say, well, okay, yes, we've had technological progress. People have watched Star Trek and become scientists. We have iPads now that are kind of like tricorders, and okay, yes, all of that. But are we living in a, in, a, in a better society now than we were when those things were just ideas? You know, you, I think you can plausibly go, well, not really. We still have all the, <laughs> all the same problems in new forms that we did then. So it's the idealism that I think is not as convincing. Certainly there's change and there's progress in some ways, but the idealistic meta narrative still remains a bit idealistic, I think. But you, you made an interesting point about Zephram Cochran because um, – it's not always easy to tell which version of history is correct, right? On the one hand, in Star in universe, in the Star Trek universe, Zephram Cochran did do all those things. He did take a symbol of war and turn it into a symbol of peace and exploration. And that's all true. On the other hand, he was a drunk and he was kind of selfish and, <laughs> and not the greatest guy. And both of those stories were true simultaneously. And I think it's just not always to tell, easy to tell which is which. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, of like religious people that I've known in my life. You know, I've known some people that are like genuine believers that are really good people and have great ideals and they fall short and do terrible things, but they're trying and they're striving and they're really good people, right? Mm -hmm. I know other people that use the, the narrative of their faith to, as an excuse to be jerks, right? Mm -hmm. As, as a just, you know, just kind of justifying their own, their own bigotry. I, I've seen both, you know, every extreme and everything in between and you know, over the years. I think people's reaction to that kind of um, diversity in genuineness in, 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 in religion and in particular is interesting because, you know, some people see that and they go, oh, my God, what a load of BS. I don't want any part of it anymore. And some people go, yeah, that's just people being people and falling short. And I still kind of see the value of certain ideals and I'm still going to kind of like strive for it myself and a lot of different reactions. And I think, you know, our reaction to the Star Trek universe is the same kind of thing. You can go, well, some people really are striving to make the world a better place. And, you know, they're trying their darndest with their tools that they've got and their experience and their expertise and their level of influence. They're trying their darndest to make the world a better place. And some people are using that language and using that terminology using the meta narratives and all the concepts that really do t pull at the heartstrings to get advantage over other people and to manipulate other people. And it's not always easy to tell which ones are which, which ones are the genuine ones and which ones are the snake oil because they sound the same, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's just an interesting feature of, of how these meta narratives work on, on motivating people um, because, you know, structurally they have the same influence. And, and I think it, I, I guess my ultimate point is, is that it's really important to be critical and skeptical and discerning 
trying to discern which stories are genuinely ideals and which things are genuinely worth pursuing and which people are genuinely trying their hardest to be good people and to work towards making the world a better place and which ones are doing it for selfish purposes or to be manipulative or whatever. And I don't think it's always easy to tell, but I think this is why I think it's important to have a position of, of skepticism. You can't just take any, any, any narrative or any meta narrative that comes your way and go, sign me up. <laughs> Let's do it. Right. Imagine, <laughs> Imagine that, you know, if, if every time a Scientologist or every time a jihadist or every time, you know, some, you know, some crazy political theory came along and said, I've got this great story about what you should be doing. Oh, well, sign me up for that. Right. That shouldn't be our position. Our position should be one of skepticism. We should go, well, here's all the downsides and here's all the negatives and mm -hmm. here's all the here's all the reasons not to do that. And here's all the bad things that could happen. Here's all the reasons to be skeptical. And if it can, and if a narrative or a meta narrative can stand the test of all of that kind of critical examination, then maybe you've got something genuine. So I think part of my motivation in thinking about it in these ways, is if you could, if you really poke and prod and push and resist the Star Trek universe as much as you can and go, well, even given all of that, it's still something to strive towards then maybe you've got something. And I think that's what we've got going on, honestly, here in the United States. You know, if you look at all of the inequality and all the oppression and all of the greed and all of the, you know, internal wheelings and dealings that go on in politics, all this stuff, you can go, wow, this United States thing is a terrible concept. Look at all the bad things that go on. You can go, well, yeah, but we've got these ideals and we keep coming back to them, even given all of those bad things. I think you can say that about the Star Trek universe too. Look at all the ideals. Look at the potential we have as a species. And that's the essentially what Gene Roddenberry had to say. Look at our potential. The world is a terrible place right now, but it could be better and we have potential. And if and if you look at all of our failings and all of our struggles and you still take a look at the ideal and go, yeah, but that's still worth striving for and I'm still going to get out of bed every day and try to make that happen, then maybe you've got something. But I think the problem is people who are genuinely good orators, good at rhetoric, good at manipulating other people can convince you to follow a meta narrative that doesn't have those high ideals. And I think it's just not always easy to tell which ones are which, but, but I do think it's important to, to embrace that position of skepticism because that skepticism is what is, is the litmus test for which meta narratives are genuine ideals and, and genuinely worth striving for and which ones should be left to, to use a phrase on the ash heap of mm, history. Mm, good points. I was thinking about the Deep Space Nine episode, The Storyteller, and it occurs to me that the way in which we tell a story can can really be just as powerful as the story itself. And I think sometimes important stories end up, as you say, on the ash heap of history because they weren't well told or they weren't well received. And and I think that's that's somewhat of the message behind the storyteller miles was not a great storyteller he was he was uncomfortable he was unsure he was he was uncertain about the story he was telling and he couldn't influence the people he couldn't stir within them the the courage and sense of unity and it took someone who had that confidence to get up there and and really tell a story that stirred the people and it's a shame because i th again i think that there are important stories in our own narrative and for that matter in the star trek narrative i think that there are sometimes great stories that uh, haven't been well received you know i i think about uh you know even in, even in my own rewatches there are episodes that i have a tendency to skip over and we've talked about this on on this podcast you know as we've talked about the philosophical content i've had to go wow, why do I keep skipping over that? Because it's actually a really good story or there's a really good message behind it or you know, there's a really great philosophical point that I've been missing out on because I've written the story off as you know, campy or, or whatever. And so Zachary, I, I think that's an important distinction to make when we're talking about meta narratives. Sometimes important stories just don't make their way into that meta narrative because of the way that they were told or because they were dismissed, you know, outright. As you were talking, I was thinking about 
a conversation that might happen between a younger version of myself and my current slightly older version of myself. The younger version of myself, Zach, the younger philosopher, would have said, but none of that should matter, right? People should think more propositionally. They should look at the evidence for something. They should weigh the reasons. They should come up with a logical conclusion, and that should be the motivating factor. So kind of from from a, a pure idealistic philosophy standpoint, I sort of think none of this rhetoric stuff should matter. The way the message is delivered, the emotional appeals, the rhetoric. I, you know, that younger Zach would have said, none of that matters. Let's be philosophers and be logicians and think through all the reasons for and against things. But in reality, I think older Zach has recognized that if you actually want to convince people of something, you need to appeal to them at a deeper, emotional, less logical level than that. And that's the only way that they will be motivated and really embrace something and internalize it. And I find that interesting because I still kind of think in a perfect world, we wouldn't be like that and we wouldn't need emotions and we wouldn't need rhetoric and we wouldn't need appeals to the heart to motivate people to do things. We would explain the reasons and people would go A versus B and they would make the right decision, right? <laughs> but in reality, that's not how people work, right? You know, we know this from Star Trek that, you know, we're the humans, the Vulcans do that. We're the humans over here that are more, <laughs> more like Dr. McCoy, right? We, you have to appeal to people at this deep visceral um, level to, to get them to really embrace an idea and, and make it their own idea. And if you can't do that, you're not a very good, um, you're, you're not a very good number of things. You're not a very good politician. You're not a very good rhetorician. You're not a very good um, teacher. You're not a very good convincer. Right? <laughs> so you have to appeal to people at this fundamental level. And it's interesting because that's more like rhetoric and less like philosophy. But, you know, unless we want philosophy to be kind of this pie in the sky thing, we kind of sit in here in the armchair and we, you know, sip our wine and smoke our cigars and, you know, talk in the abstract without any making, without making a difference with anything. Sure. Philosophy can be like that. And a lot of philosophy has been like that. But if the goal was to actually make the world a better place and convince people to do stuff, then philosophy is not going to get the job done. <laughs> you have to use narratives. And and by extension, you have to use grand narratives. And, and I think, you know, if you just looked at, at, at Star Trek as a series of 750 isolated stories on television that were loosely connected without any themes, without any meta narratives, that would not be enough to stir people to embrace that as part of their identity, I think. It's when you go, but look at what we could be as a people in the future if we really embrace some of these ideas. Now we're in the mm -hmm. level of meta narrative, and that appeals to people's heartstrings, I think. So again, the tension between individual narratives and these grander meta narratives is really interesting. And I'm starting to take the position that these meta narratives are kind of essential for motivating people to uh, internalize a story and internalize a message and take up the baton and actually do something with it. You know, it's not enough just to sit there and watch Star Trek on, you can do that. You can be a Star Trek fan that sits there and you eat your potato chips and you drink your beer and you watch Star Trek every day. You know, I've been like that sometimes every day. I'm going to watch some Star Trek. Boom. Turn the TV on. Let's watch the next episode. Let's watch another episode. Well, I'm going to watch two episodes a day. I'm feeling like lots of Star Trek today. <laughs> right? That is not enough, right? You're getting the stories, but you're not getting the message. You're not getting the grand narrative that defines the Star Trek worldview. And the Star Trek worldview is let's all work and make the world a better place. And unless you're doing something like that, you're missing the message. You're missing the, the meta story. You're just, you're just focusing on the stories. And I think, you know, if you're just watching Star Trek at the story level, I feel like you're missing something about the message of Star Trek. And I just, I'm seeing some kind of obvious people who get it already kind of understand this, but you know, it's not, there's, I guess my ultimate point is just a simple point that there's more to Star Trek than the stories. These, these individual stories are woven together into a grand story that has a message about who we are and what our potential is and what we should strive for. And if you're just focusing on the stories to the detriment of taking action towards an ideal that we all kind of believe in or want to believe in, then you're missing a big part of being a Star Trek fan. You know, Zachary, as you were talking about narrative and appealing, and I, I, I got to thinking about an episode of The Next Generation. I, I'm going to read a quote uh, from that episode. That quote is, We hoped our probe would encounter someone in the future, someone who could be a teacher, someone who could tell the others about us. That comes, of course, from the inner light. 
you know, there there's a great episode there that I think really deals with this idea of of meta narrative. And instead of just, you know, dropping a book of this culture's history off, it literally seized Captain Picard and took him to live a lifetime as another person in another culture on another planet. And that fundamentally changed him. I think uh I, I, I think Captain Picard was was different after that. Uh, throughout the rest of the run of of the next generation and he got to see the meta narrative of a different culture and at first he was reluctant he didn't want to buy into it he he wanted his life back on the enterprise but as he was there he came to embrace it and to you know to the point that you know at the end of the episode he's playing that that haunting melody on that flute and I, I love the fact that that flute kept making you know re- recurring appearances within uh, the next generation. But again, we hoped our probe would encounter someone in the future, someone who could be a teacher, someone who could tell the others about us. And it, it seems to me that you know here was a culture that was willing to go to extremes to share their meta narrative so that it wouldn't be forgotten. And it just it, it just causes me to wonder. You know, if we miss the opportunity to really to really shape the future by making history and the narrative of our past, you know, more appealing. I mean, I I know we don't have holodecks. It's not like these are the voyages where I can just conjure up a historical program and insert myself into it like Riker does in in that uh, series finale episode of, of Enterprise. But it it seems to me that perhaps we're we're missing an opportunity to make our narrative more appealing, more um, more real uh, to people. Uh, it's 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 one thing to read something in a history book; it's another thing to live it. Can you imagine if that probe in the inner light had just dropped off a history book and Captain Picard took the history book and said, well, this is interesting. I'll put that on the shelf and read that someday. <laughs> it would be a very different episode than than having to relive uh, you know, a lifetime in this entire culture. But you know, that's essentially – you made a point that this is exactly what's happened. Captain Picard had an experiential relationship to this culture. He got to live their grand narrative in, in some sense. And, and really inter- all they were doing was telling a story. But they did it in a way that that engaged him and made him a part of it. But it wasn't just a day in the life of; it was a, a lifetime. He lived, mm-hmm. you know, most of a lifetime, and 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 got to be immersed in the narrative. And wasn't it wasn't just like he got to live a day and went, oh, cool, that was interesting. I don't care about that anymore, and went back to the Enterprise. Right? He got to live an entire lifetime. So he internalized who these people were and what they were all about, and where they were going, and what their struggles were. And he took it with him into the future, and it became a part of him in some deep sense. And I, it, it, you raise an interesting question. What would it be like for all of us to really internalize our own narratives? Because I think a lot of us, myself included, you included, most of us included, there's a routine to life, right? You get up, you have your breakfast, you take your shower, you go to work, you come home, you do your podcast, all the stuff you do, right? There's a routine mm-hmm. to it. But if if that's the level that you're operating on, the routine aspects of life, then you're missing a big part of who we are. You know, it, it, just think about what what would it be like if all of us really embraced, you know, our own meta narratives, and that could be me as a person and my family's narrative. It could be my country's narrative. You know, here in the United States, we've got our meta narratives that we tell about who we are as Americans. People who live in other countries have their meta narratives about you know what it means to be part of their countries. We have Western society. We have global society. As Star Trek fans, we go. You know, we see our potential into the far future and what that means for progress and being the best versions of ourselves. You know, I've been an educator, so I wake up and go, well, I'm an educator. So that's my that's what I do. I'm going to help people learn today. And right. There's a grandeur to that that you can embrace and make part of who you are. If all of us every day embraced our best meta narratives about who we are as individuals, who we are in our families, who we are in our countries, who we are as citizens of the world, and who we could be into the future. If every moment of our day, to, to you know, to sort of overstate it a little bit, if every moment of our day was viewed in terms of what can I do to be the best version of myself in light of all of these narratives, these meta narratives, 
Think how interesting that would be. We would have so much more motivation to get out of bed and make great things happen and be the best versions of ourselves. But we get so caught up in the routine, it's like we forget about the narratives. It's exciting to be able to get up and be a part of the world, to be a part of the American story or the story of Western civilization or the story of the human race into the future. That's a really exciting, powerful idea. And so much of life doesn't involve taking that into account. And I think that's really sad. It seems to me, Zachary, for a great many people, they just have gotten lost in the, the you know, waking up, going to work and paying bills. And that, that has become the whole of their existence. And so in many ways, they're, they're not really buying into the narrative, they're, whatever that narrative may be. What it, and I'm not saying that there is a narrative they should buy into. You know, whether it's the, you know, our national narrative or whether it's a religious narrative or whether, you know, what, whatever it may be, they're, they're not buying into a narrative, uh, at least as it, as it pertains to a, to a grand, you know, overall meta narrative. You know, yeah, just, I'm, I'm talking more about the meta narratives, these grand narratives. So. Yeah, they're just they're just waking up They're You know, they're trying to get through the day, working for the weekend. You know, I think about, you know, this, this mentality of just, you know, trying to get through your week to get to the weekend and, and, and really missing out on the opportunity. You know, when I hear, for instance, Captain Picard talk about, you know, in uh, first contact, how, you know, we, we no longer, you know, live for those things that, you know, we work to better ourselves. You know, this is, this is that grand meta narrative that we're talking about. I guess, Captain Picard, though, he says that so syrupy that it loses its force, right? What if, I mean, seriously, you know, you said an interesting phrase. I'm working for the weekend. Okay, I think that's pathetic. I, we all do it. I do it. I'm pathetic when I do it. We're pathetic if that's where we're functioning, right? But if I woke up and I said, I'm not working for the weekend. I'm working for the 24th century. Take that. <laughs> You know, that should be more, that should be a little more powerful than, oh, we work to better ourselves. I think Captain Picard loses the emphasis on that, on that phrase. He should say, we work for the future, darn it. We don't work for, not just to better ourselves. We don't work to play classical music at 10 forward. We're working for the 25th century. But I think that says something about 24th century humans. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe it has become kind of syrupy for him. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, Zachary, we all have to be our own Syrah. We all have to be able to tell ourselves the narrative in a passionate way that stirs us up and causes us to well up with the courage to overcome whatever it is that's you know, well, coming against us. I guess I'm advocating taking the Cisco position versus the Picard position. The Picard position is we work to better ourselves. The Cisco position is fortune favors the bold. <laughs> right? And and that's a narrative I can buy into. I just I think that's a slightly they're basically mean they it's interesting because they basically have the same worldview and they have the same basic mm -hmm. ideals and believe the same basic things. But I think Captain Cisco has kind of said, I'm gonna get on my ship and I'm gonna go you know, in this war, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to force us into the future. And I, I just think it would be interesting if all of us, you know, kind of took a longer perspective, embraced our, our own stories, drunk our own Kool-Aid in a way and said, you know, I'm going to live not just for today. I'm going to live for the, for my country. I'm going to live for the world. I'm going to live for my civilization. I'm going to live for my fellow human beings and I'm going to live for the future. And I'm going to start right now. What an interesting world that would be. And I don't know. And that's going to mean something different for all of us. Some of us are going to be scientists and some of us are going to be teachers and some of us are going to be podcasters and some of us are going to do whatever. But, you know, so it, I'm not saying we should all, you know, think and operate the same way. But I think what we have done is sadly because of the routine of life, because of our, you know, increasingly kind of questionable economy where we're not, you know, confident we'll be able to eat in a year or 10 years or 50 years. We're not confident um, that the future we want to embrace will ever come to fruition. There's a kind of apathy that's set in culturally, even amongst the people who really believe the meta narratives the most. So I, it's kind of a challenge, like, you know, check your own apathy and get out of bed and start living for something bigger than yourself. And, if, and that takes a meta narrative because you can't live for something bigger than yourself if you don't believe in something bigger than yourself. So that's kind of mm -hmm. like my Star Trek sermon of the day. That's my Star Trek oratory. <laughs> but, you, but, you know, you used the word there and I, I, I think that's this is the this is the key word. You, you use the word perspective, talking about, you know, looking at things from 
from a certain perspective. And I, th I think sometimes that really is the key. And, and again, I'm going with episodes of Star Trek where they are telling stories within the story. Uh, the, the Voyager episode, Author, Author. It's, it's fascinating to me because the doctor in many ways is telling his own story, but he's telling it from a perspective in which the story becomes a bit jaded, a bit warped. And really, in, in many ways, it's offensive to his friends because, you know, my God, is this the way you really, you know, you really see your life? And, and the answer is, heck yeah, that's the way well, he sees his life. The concept of perspective, I think, in the history of philosophy since Nietzsche has been skewed and misunderstood. Nietzsche is often accused of being a nihilist or is claiming that all of these meta narratives or meaning is kind of reducible to mere perspective. But if you read him more subtly, really he's saying we need to embrace this notion of story and meaningfulness and, and narratives. You know, even if we don't quite believe it, we need these concepts. And I'm kind of saying, look, what we need to do is not reduce all of these grand, meaningful concepts to mere perspectives. We need to embrace the fact that you can take your situation, the world around you, and you can look at it from a longer term, more meaningful perspective, right? That's a more positive, substantive sense of perspective that that embraces this idea of grand narratives and meaningfulness versus trying to eliminate it all away as mere subjective perspectives. I know really because I, I think in philosophy, perspective kind of gets a bad rap, right? Perspective is like, oh, that's what those storytellers do, or that's what those rhetoric people do, or that's what those pure subjectivists say, right? Right? They're not concerned with objective meaning or objective you know, ethics or objective whatever, right? But I think you can, you can take those meta narratives and tell them as stories. Like, here's who we are as people. We rose from the, I mean, you could even do it on a cosmic scale, you know, from the ashes of the Big Bang arose galaxies and planets and civilizations. And, mm -hmm. you know, that leads to, you know, you know, living conscious biological beings that become the best versions of themselves and make for a meaningful, interesting, moral, uh, you know, meaningful universe, right? You can tell all of this on the cosmic scale as a story, as a narrative or a grand, like the grandest meta narrative mm -hmm. of all the cosmic meta narrative. And if you, if you tell that with rhetorical force as a story, you can take that perspective on the trajectory that we're on along the ride, right? And if you don't tell it that way, if you go, well, I don't believe in perspectives. I'm going to try to be objective. Well, what's my objective reality? You know, I got to get out of bed. I got to eat my breakfast. I got to do my work. I got to do my podcast. And you know what? I got to do it all again tomorrow. And 10 years from now, I'll be doing the same thing, right? That's the kind of objective fact of life, right? But if you, if you tell life in that way without the story component, without the perspective of where you're, where you're situated in the long-term trajectory of your own civilization or in, in, you know, again, you can kind of take any perspective you want, like any level, like, you know, I can tell that in terms of my lifetime, or I can tell it in terms of my country, or I can tell it in terms of my species, or I can tell it in terms of all of cosmic reality, right? How, it depends how grand you want to go with it. But I think if you don't take it to the next level, whatever level that is, you know, it's slightly bigger than the level you're functioning at now, you're focusing so much on the objective facts of your life that you've lost the heart and the meaningfulness and the trajectory. And, and, and if you tell that as a passionate story, you know, like here I am and here's the direction I'm going because that's who I am and where I'm going. You know, if you can, <laughs> if you can embrace that, then you're, you're taking something that could be boring, objective reality and turning it into a passionate, interesting, subjective perspective. And I guess my claim here is that, that the perspective is not a negative concept to be reduced away like philosophers often want to do. That perspective can give you the force to get stuff done. Sure, sure. Back to author, author. I find it fascinating because the doctor sees himself as oppressed. He sees himself as limited. That <laughs> mobile emitter is this this giant weight upon his you know upon his back and. You know, he's he's constantly maligned and abused by the by the crew, so forth and so on. When the opposite is argued within the episode that he has a tremendous amount of freedom because of the mobile emitter. He's not uh, he's not uh, confined 
to, to you know to the medical bay but he's able to roam freely around the ship he's able to go on away missions and uh, you know he's been given freedom he has friends and he's <laughs> had <laughs> romantic relationships and as tom and paris would say and... <laughs> as tom paris would say it's the doctor's world you're just living in it <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I again, just back to this idea of, of perspective, you know, he saw himself as oppressed and, and that was his narrative because of his perspective. When it was argued that he has a tremendous amount of freedom and so forth and so on, it, it helped to change his perspective a little bit. So I, and I'm not saying that one of those is right or one of those is wrong. I, I think, I think you can argue for, for both of them, but I just want to make that point that that sometimes perspective can make a difference. Well, we, I think we all want to be, we're all the hero of our own story, right? We all want to be George Washington crossing the Delaware, or we all want to be Captain Picard on the Enterprise, or we all want to be President of the United States, or we all want to be whatever, right? We're the hero of our own story, and that's how we all view ourselves. And I think that episode is really interesting because it does drive home the point that we are all the heroes of our own stories, our own narratives. On the other hand, most of us are more like Joe Soldier in the boat while George Washington is crossing the Delaware. <laughs> we're, mo- we're more like a long for the ride but if you can take if you can be okay with that if you can go i'm not george washington but darn it i'm in the boat and we're going somewhere you know i think if you can take that perspective that i'm you know i'm not just along for the ride i'm playing a part i'm not the main guy but i'm playing a part to build whatever the future is going to be then that can be okay you know we might all view ourselves as george washington but i don't think we are you know i i kind of view myself as captain picard i'm sitting in my chair and i'm in command and i'm doing whatever but in reality i'm more like you know the guy six levels down work do, playing my part doing my function while the enterprise is doing something amazing right yeah i'm scrub, i'm scrubbing plasma conduits it's right. it's okay so i'm, and, I'm and, on the enterprise but what's what's admirable about people in the star trek universe i think is they embrace that they go i don't get to sit in the center seat but I'm doing something amazing because we collectively are doing something amazing. Now, if all of us could take that perspective, I think we would all be happier, <laughs> honestly. We would all um, have a, a better sense of meaning in terms of who we are and where we're going and what our purpose is. But sadly, we all, I think maybe again, kind of like writing a diary here, like we all get disappointed that we're not sitting in the center seat. Really? I don't of- know, Zachary. That was not good enough for Blue Tunic Picard. <laughs> Not good enough, damn it. Not good enough. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> in reality, most of us are not sitting in the center seat. We're more like a junior officer playing our part. And if we if you let that be a disappointment to ourselves, and oh, darn it, I wish I could be captain. I'm just so pissed off I have to sit here and scrub plasma conduits, right? If that's your attitude, then you're not going anywhere. You're not part of the team. You're not part of the group. Mm-hmm. You're not achieving anything. But if, if you kind of take this collectivist position and say, yep, I'm scrubbing plasma manifolds today, but we on the Enterprise, together, all of us, are doing something amazing and in terms of the story of the Federation, look at what humanity is doing with this awesome thing with the Federation and Starfleet and starships and exploration. It's amazing. And I get to be part of it. You know, most people in the Star Trek universe kind of take that perspective and it's admirable that they do here in the real world. We often don't. And I think sadly our lives are not as meaningful to us subjectively as they could be if we did take that perspective. You know, a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned Joe Soldier in the boat. That just lends itself to to what I was talking about very early on in this podcast. Those are the stories I want to hear as a storyteller, as a as a, a, a an armchair historian. Those are the stories I want to hear because I think that they are just as important as the story of George Washington crossing the Delaware. It's it's the Joe Soldier in the boat. I think I think his story is just as important. And that takes me back to first contact. I think it's interesting because the crew of the Enterprise really play a backseat role to Zephyr Cochran in in that story. They they their their stories don't get told. They we don't we don't hear that it was uh, Jordy and and Riker in that uh, in, in the Phoenix. We just know it was that from Cochran. They're they're playing these backseat parts, just you know, taking a backseat to history, so to speak, now, but very, being very much a part of it. 
you know that there's some dude who was riding along with George Washington in that boat, and he wrote a journal that was like, that George Washington dude doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> I was really running the show, but no you know, no one's going to remember that. Do you think there's some junior officer in the Enterprise who's like, that Captain Picard doesn't know what he's doing. He's always making these bad decisions. I'm really running the show here. Captain Picard is out there in outer space. It's funny you should. It, it's funny you should say that, Zachary, because uh, I I read a book uh, many years ago. I don't honestly I don't remember the name of the book, but in the book there were a collection of letters uh, Revolutionary War soldiers had written, and one of the letters, as I recall, was written uh, by a, a soldier at Valley Forge, really expressing some doubts about, you know, whether or not we were going to win the war, whether or not uh, George Washington knew what he was doing, whether was he even going to survive the winter, uh, you know, the, the soldier, whether or not the soldier was going to survive the winter. And it really became a window into the hardships of, of those, uh, you know, brave men there who, you know, weathered the winter at Valley Forge. Um, I, I I think it's interesting you say that because in the midst of that grand narrative that we have, uh, there were people who had doubts, who had concerns, who were afraid, who were uncertain uh, whether the decisions being made were the right decisions, so forth and so on. This could be part of the hidden genius in the next Star Trek series of making the main character not the captain. Wouldn't that be fascinating, too? Kind of questioning those decisions and, you know, uncertain about the orders. and Well, I mean, this happens in the Star Trek universe all the time. Captains do this with admirals, right? Cap- captains generally don't respect what admirals think at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the fact they take this kind of adversarial position in relation to, you know, people at their desks back at Starfleet Command, right? But on the ship, people tend to fall in line behind the captain. If that's In reality, that's probably not as, you know, it, it, of course, in reality. If, if Star Trek were real, that wouldn't actually be the case, right? <laughs> This is all hypothetical and in outer space, but but in most organizations, right, people don't just naturally fall in line. People have doubts and fears and, you know, they question the decisions of people above them. And that's part of life, interpersonal life as a group, right? But in Star Trek, you don't see a whole lot of that. You tend to see people falling in line behind the captain and... Um, especially people who are along for the ride, people who are doing all the work but not getting a lot of credit for it. You know, I, you can imagine the guy in the boat with George Washington going, God, George Washington is getting credit for all of this <laughs> and no one's going to remember my name, <laughs> right? But I, I'm the one with a rifle on my shoulder and feet that hurt, right? <laughs> or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one marching through the snow with no yeah, boots Or on. in Star Trek, I'm the one scrubbing plasma manifolds, getting the Enterprise from A to B. Yeah. Yeah. So, Zachary, it sounds like you're advocating for uh, something along the lines of Star Trek Discovery, The Lower Decks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind seeing that myself. But uh, coming coming to the end of our uh, conversation about uh, narratives, meta narratives, and the philosophy of storytelling, uh, Zachary, do you have any final thoughts? Well, I think I just personally have kind of a mixed relationship to meta narratives. On the one hand, I've seen there are so many of them to choose from, and we've seen the collapse of many of the meta narratives. So it's natural to take a position of skepticism, like, okay, for any given meta narrative story about who we are and where we're going and what trajectory we're on, we should naturally, I think, take a position of skepticism because a lot of these have not come to fruition and not panned out the way they were advertised to be. On the other hand, I'm an optimistic, idealistic person. I myself want to see a better version of myself and a better version of mankind and us do great things into the future. And that requires something like a grand narrative to provide the motivational force to get out of bed and build a better world. On the other hand, we're in firmly in the realm of rhetoric and emotions rather than logic and philosophy in, in that in that regard. So I, I think the, the tension between analyzing narratives and meta narratives and thinking about causal factors and, and this this plain deep seated emotional um, level at which meta narratives seem, seem to operate, they're appealing because they appeal to us viscerally and internally and emotionally rather than logically and rationally. And I think that's an important part of getting stuff done. Um, you know, whether the Star Trek meta narratives 
because I think there's more than one. There's like the technological progress meta narrative, mm-hmm. then there's the self improvement meta narrative, and there's the exploration meta narrative, and there's the political meta narratives of Star Trek. So these are kind of it's not just one Star Trek meta narrative. There's a bunch yeah. of yeah, a bunch of related overlapping meta narratives. Whether any of those are believable and practical and will actually come to fruition in the future, I think you know the future is hard to guess. It might or it might not. I have no idea. Right in 400 years, we might still be asking this question as as a people. Uh, I think that's probably the more likely scenario, honestly, that in you know, in the 24th century here in the real world, we probably won't have figured it all out and it won't be as idealistic as what you see in the Star Trek universe. On the other hand, I do think that some meta narratives stand the test of time. I think the American meta narrative for you and I has stood the test of time, right? You know, it's at least a couple hundred years, you know, creeping up on two and a half hundred years. Mm-hmm. Western civilization has lasted for, oh, I don't know, 2,500 years or so, right? And these, some of these meta narratives seem to be uh, more persistent and more idealistic and last longer than others. And some tend to die out and end up, as we've called it, on the ash heap of history. So which meta narratives will persist and which will die out is an interesting question. I do think there's enough substance to the meta narratives in the Star Trek universe and they appeal to us at such a visceral human level um, in terms of our ability to, to, to think about what we could become. Right? We, I think we all do want to be better than we are. Most of us, not everyone. There's some people that don't. They're genuinely evil, evil people that don't want to be better. <laughs> Those of us that really want to be better, I think you know the Star Trek worldview appeals uh, to us at a very fundamental level, and I think that will continue to be true. Uh, I do think uh, a lot of merit- meta narratives will die out. You know, whether the American meta narrative will persist or die out is an interesting question. Whether Western civilization will persist or die out is an interesting question. But I do think there is something more universal and more Uh, fundamental to the vision that we see in the Star Trek universe. Again, you can kind of bracket the technological stuff, like who knows what technology is going to do and what 24th Mm -hmm. century technology will be. I don't think that's the part I'm talking about. The parts about striving to be better and the parts about coming together as people and solving problems, these kinds of fundamental meta narratives have the power to persist over time. So Star Trek could become something that culturally binds us together for a long time to come and provides the basis for a long-term meta narrative. You know, what we have in reality is 50 years of Star Trek history, 51 years of Star Trek history now. That's not enough, I think, to know whether the Star Trek meta narrative will persist in terms of hundreds of years or thousands of years and continue to be that motivating force that binds people together and gives them motivation for 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 striving to to achieve things in the future um i do think some meta narratives have done that um american meta narrative meta narratives meta narratives about science meta narratives about western civilization but whether star trek will you know be among that pantheon of meta narratives in the long run is anyone's guess but i do think there's reason to be skeptical like we haven't seen the star trek vision come to fruition in our lifetimes we haven't seen the egalitarian um, you know, radically libertarian view of of uh, American society come to fruition in our lifetimes. We haven't seen the full flower of Western enlightenment in our lifetimes, right? <laughs> We've seen the dark underbelly more times than not. So I do think we have reason to be skeptical, but I hope that we will learn from past mistakes, that we will continue to have motivation to be the best versions of ourselves. But I, I can't imagine doing that without a meta narrative. I think my biggest concern is that we will continue to take a position of apathy, that we will cease believing in meaningfulness and purpose and meta narratives to the point where we just stop trying. And that will be a sad, sad day. So I think if there's one fundamental takeaway, it's not to let the apathy and our, and disbelief and skepticism about things like meta narratives and these grand stories that have burned people in the past be a reason not to keep striving to achieve great things in the future. You said virtually everything I had planned to say, and you said it uh, ever so much more eloquently. Um, but I, I, I do want to just simply add to that, that I, I think that meta narrative is important in that it gives us something to strive for. It it points us in a direction and it says, go there. And I think that's important. And like you, I, I hope that apathy doesn't become the thing that destroys that. Because I, I think, uh, like Gene Roddenberry, I, I think that humanity is full of potential. And I think that we can become so much more than what we are. And I think if 
any of the great stories in our history have taught us anything, it's that, that, that we have the potential to become much more than what we are. But we have to be very cautious about that dark underbelly and not to not to succumb to our baser natures and become the worst version of ourselves. And so I think that's the thing that endures with Star Trek. At least, you know, I, I think I think it's the thing that has caused it to endure for 50 years. And I think we'll we'll allow it to be around for 50 more, whether we achieve all of those things or not. And whether the causal factors will, you know, will lead to anything that looks like the Star Trek universe. You know, who knows? Time will time will tell. And maybe it not it won't unfold necessarily the way uh, that it, it did at least on screen. But uh, again, it gives us something to strive for. And I, again, I point to I point to the people who have been inspired by Star Trek in one way or another. They've chosen a career path, or they've invented something, or or you know whatever it may be. That in some way, shape, or form, they were inspired by Star Trek and. I think that there are people who will look back at them and not necessarily Star Trek and be inspired themselves. So I think the impact of, of Star Trek uh, will will be uh, something that will uh, endure for, you know, the next two or three hundred years, whether they realize it's Star Trek or not. Uh, it just, you know, it points back to, you know, that one person who was inspired by Star Trek and did something extraordinary that inspired somebody else to do something and that inspired somebody else and so on and so forth. I do think it's a really interesting thought experiment, maybe even a challenge for all of us to wake up and tell ourselves, I'm going to embrace my meta narratives today. It sounds like a crazy <laughs> phrase, but embrace your meta narratives. Like we all have multiple meta narratives. Like there's the meta narrative of me as an individual. There's a meta narrative of me as part of my family, part of my city, part of my country, part of my world, part of the future, right? If we embrace all of those, say, I'm going to wake up and be the best human being I can possibly be today, or I'm going to be the best American or the best Canadian or the best Australian or the best Japanese or the best whatever, right? I'm going to be the best citizen of the world today. I'm going to be the best person on the fast track to the 24th century as I can today. What does that mean for what you're going to do today versus what you would do if you didn't think about your life that way? And so again, that's my kind of challenge to myself and you and, and to all of our listeners. Like, you know, if you really are a Star Trek fan, you really do embrace the meta narrative of the Star Trek universe, then what are you going to do about it? Like, what are you doing about it today, tomorrow, next week? You know, how are you making that meta narrative part of your own life? versus just living for the weekend. Because I think if that's what we're doing, that's pretty pathetic as Star Trek fans. So wake up tomorrow and be your own Syrah. You can be your own Syrah of your trek through the stars. But <laughs> narratives and meta narratives aren't the only thing we've been talking about here on Trek FM this past week. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek.FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Standard Orbit. The inscription of this book is a quotation from David Gerald, which is something he said to me in an email. <laughs> and uh, he didn't even remember saying it. I got to, I, I met him recently and showed it to him. And he was like, oh, wow, that's a pretty good quote. I didn't know I said that. I'm like, oh, yeah, you did. <laughs> but he said, the primary philosophy in Star Trek, stripped of everything else, was love one another. I think Jesus might have said something like that once, too. The Orb. It's always weird. I mean, say you're watching the original series and, you know, you find out that uh, Dr. McCoy is a real Merle Haggard fan. You <laughs> right. know that? That's and just, he might be, That's actually. really strange. <laughs> to the journey! It's his mirror universe. Oh, is he oh, good? really? Is a mirror universe on Suter? Is he, like, super benevolent and just goes around <laughs> giving money to people? He was a member of the Terran Rebellion. Giving out, giving out ice cream and kissing puppies. <laughs> Primitive culture. A look at history and culture through Star Trek. This episode was actually banned by the BBC for many years. And they always said, I don't know if this is true, not so much because of the kind of allegorical significance of the episode, but because of this uh, single line in it where Data says, he basically says, oh, well, you know, the IRA basically achieved what they wanted in I think it's 2024. 2024, yeah. You know, it's uh, <laughs> coming up. 
And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all of these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit that subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on the iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and most third-party podcast apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link as well. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to share your thoughts with us. The best place to join in the larger conversation with us is in the Babel Conference, our listeners-only discussion group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Just choose Message to a Trek FM Show and select Metatrex. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at TrekFM and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash TrekFM. Well, speaking of contact information, Mike, when you're not busy composing your next meta narrative, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the TrekFM network? Well, Zachary, you can always catch me on Facebook. That's where I'm most active, certainly around the Babel Conference. On Twitter, my Twitter handle is at cmichael1701. I'm occasionally on Instagram, cmichael1701. You can also read my blog about publishing my novel and a little bit about life. That is cmichael1701.wordpress.com. And Zachary, when you are not enthusiastically waking up and scrubbing those plasma conduits, where can our... Listeners find you around the Trek FM network and on the interwebs. You mean scrubbing plasma conduits for the greater good of humanity and the future. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek.fm as co-host of To The Journey, Trek FM's show dedicated to all things Star Trek Voyager, along with my two co-hosts over there, Suzanne Williamson and Kay Shaw. You can find me in the Babel Conference if you'd like to talk about Star Trek and philosophy with me there. And you can find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. But Mike, speaking of your novel, I hope you're not just writing a novel. You're writing a novel filled with meta narratives and meaningfulness. It is, it is chocked full of meta narratives. I would hope. I would expect nothing less. <laughs> Well, if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and many more, all available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of time and money to produce, host, and distribute these podcasts each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Metatrex team from around the network. Specifically, we'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and Brandon Shea Mutala, our Patreon manager. And a special thank you and a shout out to our two associate producers here on Metatrex. We'd like to thank Patrick Devlin. You can find Patrick under the Twitter handle at MagicDrop5. And Kay Shaw, my co-host over on To The Journey. You can find her under the Twitter handle at Chaco Weeble. And don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. And check out audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to Metatrex, a Star Trek and philosophy podcast. Until next time, when we will once again boldly go where no philosophers have gone before. How's that for a good meta-narrative?